Rick Knoll has been actively searching for the Sasquatch since 1969 and continues his pursuit with extended field trips into the Pacific Northwest's most remote regions. Now Rick has worked with Peter Byrne, Rene DeHinden, Grover Krantz, John Green, Dr. Jeff Meldrum, and the BFRO during all of this. He has also helped with many documentaries on the subject of Bigfoot, including Animal X, The Skookum Expedition, and Sasquatch, Legend Meets Science. Now I met Mr. Knoll at Sasquatch Summit last year, and I had an impromptu interview with him in the hallway like I did with Crypto Mundo's Craig Wooleater. I'm all about seizing the moment, so enjoy the show. Welcome to After Hours. My name is Richter. I am your host. Richter! What? Leave him alone! This shit is real. Now we got Richter go and we're going to have to hear it about it all night. Yeah. <laughs> that's a bunch of screaming memes out there and that's the scoop that has been reported so far. Thanks for driving me like a snub. I'm not interested in believing in something. Either it's real or it's not. By your opinion that you are no-kill, you are dooming the species to be extinct. They are what they are. It doesn't matter what we call them. Let's remove ourselves from them a little bit. And I think that's something that the Bigfoot community can actually learn a little bit from. I actually am trying to push the envelope of science here. When are we going to make a video, Richter? And I mean not an X-rated one. Dr. Todd, you've also been called the scoff dick. <laughs> yeah, well, have these creatures stood against a backdrop of trees, I probably never would have seen them. You can't talk about I can't. So you guys are going to bag a Bigfoot and get us a body. We're giving it uh, our best efforts. We thought that we had the holy grail of DNA. Our hero, Bob Gimlin's with us. Hello, is this thing on? Am I muted? Can you hear me? Hey, Richter, I've got a question for you. How does it feel to lose Bigfoot Bounty? Hmm. My question is, why do you think Bigfoot is real? Richter does put a lot of effort <laughs> into his costuming, doesn't he? Yeah, well, I mean, by effort, if you mean bending over and picking up whatever's on the floor. My. Well, in my opinion, After Hours with Richter is the number one Bigfoot webcast. Uh, what's your name again? Oh. Don't piss Richter off. <laughs> Richter, behave. Hey, welcome to After Hours. My name is Richter, and joining me today is the legendary Rick Knoll. Now, he's been doing Bigfoot research since 1969. Now, he's very familiar with the Skookum cast. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to talk to him about that and the BFRO. Okay. Is that cool? Yeah. Awesome. Let's go. Rick, you've uh, met some legendary Bigfoot researchers who are no longer with us. Yes. Uh, Rene DeHinden. Yep. And uh, Dr. Grover Krantz. Yes. And... Uh, John Green. Oh my gosh. That is so recent. Yes. Yeah. There's a lot and, more. Oh, and there's more coming too. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 a very, it's very uh, shocking. Uh, I wish I'd gotten to know those guys before. I noticed that with Peter Byrne, I talked to him and I had him at Beachfoot this past year uh, for After Hours. We were talking about the future of Bigfoot and the ramifications of this new train of thought that has seemed to um, infecting the world of Bigfoot, the woo. The what? The woo. The woo. Bigfoot's your forest friend. Bigfoot talks to you through okay. mind speak. Okay. Bigfoot cloaks. <laughs> Interdimensional being, Bigfoot can uh -huh. heal you, uh -huh. okay, and be your spiritual guide. And the list goes on. And you talked to Peter Byrne about this? Oh yeah, we talked about the whole thing. Wow. And I, 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 I'm personally not fond of that train of thought. And there's a lot of um, uncontrolled imagination. People oh, we're in the middle of it now. Misinterpretation of natural phenomena mm -hmm. all the time. Um, Cloaking. Zapping. Did, did Rene DeHinden and, and Tom Slick ever talk about those kind of things? Cloaking, zapping, mind speaking? We didn't hear about them in those days. I never heard about screams. We heard about whistling. Well, there's no data, nothing to back that up. You might as well even talk about Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, unicorns. Mm -hmm. Put Bigfoot right in that category. It's like a joke, you know? And, uh, 
<laughs> just back on me real quick. I believe Sasquatch is real because of the Native Americans. All the different tribes with all their different dialects. They weren't texting each other. They weren't sending smoke signals to each other. They all weren't smoking the same peyote together. And they all talked about uh, the Skookum, the Oma, Sasquatch, the list goes on. All very similar. They weren't creating magical creatures. They were so in tune with their environment and Sasquatch was a part of their environment. So that's why I'm a firm believer that this stuff is real. Not because you're a Caucasian white man making YouTube videos like, Bigfoot's real because I say it's real. I hate that. You know, Dr. Johnson. Okay, for example. So, um, where I'm going with this, you being in the field for so long, when did you notice that the Wu train of thought has started to take over? Because it really is starting to take over. With all the followers, social media, it's totally corrupting it. Well, it certainly accelerated it, uh, the social media did. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, there was, uh, you know, back in the days, uh, you know, in, in the UBC conference, uh, 78, there was a couple of strange things that uh, were presented, like a, an aerial of an, an, you know, an antenna off of a car, mm -hmm. uh, 57 Buick, I think it was, that was supposed to be bit by a, a Bigfoot, that was uh, Jan Beckjord, that was trying to present that and got kicked out. Um, so, that, you know, there was, yeah, I think there's, uh, I don't know if it's bipolarism or, or drugs, I don't know what it is that, that's causing uh, people to think some of that stuff, but uh, Occam's razor, which we just heard about, mm -hmm. is where you don't try to explain an unknown with another unknown. Right. And uh, that's where a lot of people are trying to do that because they, they can't get anywhere with the, the first unknown. They're like desperate to find meaning. Yes. Desperate to find, so they're creating their own answers. Yeah. Hmm. Now, I noticed in Al Berry's book, Bigfoot, there's a whole chapter about what we call the woo today. Mm -hmm. When I was reading the book, I mean, my God, this came out in 1977. Yeah. And yet the woo was already starting to fester and creep in. Yeah, that's the days of Argosy and True Magazine. Uh, and, and there was, uh, they, they latched on to some of the spiritual stuff that was happening around Shasta Lake and the, the uh, old uh, cave systems that, that are there. Mm -hmm. It brought a lot of uh, new age people up there to, uh, explore, and they came back with fantastic tales, you know. Right. And Alberry was—I uh, don't know if he fell in with that, but uh, later on in life, I think a lot of people start opening their minds. Okay. So when I was a young kid reading Bigfoot books, my first uh, Bigfoot book I read was that yellow pocket book with Don Hunter and Renee DeHinden with the yellow yeah. Yeah. Sasquatch, and then I went on to uh, John Green's book. Mm -hmm. And the, but I never remember hearing anything about MindSpeak. Uh, reading about MindSpeak, they said they would, there'd be whistles, you know, mm -hmm. the communication of whistles. So then Peter Byrne backed that up. And so it seems like now MindSpeak is the new way that Sasquatch communicates. Well, there's some people uh, that may allude to some of the stories that, that John Green collected, mm -hmm. such as uh, someone that, that held up a rifle, like William Rome, mm -hmm. and uh, he was going to shoot. Uh, what they thought was an animal down uh, eating some bushes, some uh, not berries, but it was actually the leaves, and stripping them off with his teeth. And he had it in his sights, and he, all of a sudden he just couldn't shoot. And maybe some of these people are thinking that that was exactly. this mind speak kind of thing. Right, right. You know, leave me alone. Don't, right. you know, I'm just an animal. There's no reason for you to shoot me. I'm, look at, I'm sort of like you. Rick was once with the BFRO. Yes. What happened? Uh, the BFRO. Well, I call it the BFR. No, <laughs> that's just my opinion. Well, it was supposed to be the BFRO, but <laughs> it didn't go that way. Um, the BFRO. Uh, Bigfoot Field Research Organization. Yeah. There's something on the hill. Shut up. Yeah, there was. Uh, I. I think the BFRO started out with a really good plan. And then, for some reason, it it took a, a sideways, yeah, sideways route uh, to where the people were starting to sell their souls mm -hmm. to, to just get the, uh, the website. 
I don't know if they if they have any commercials on their website, but the more traffic they have, the more commercials they can get, and the more they get paid for having that website up and running. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not sure if that's part of it or what, but definitely the TV series was something that they hoped for for a long, long and time. And Matt got it. Yeah. Uh, some dear friends of mine, Todd Neese and his wife, Diane Stalking, uh, told me that back in the 90s, and they said this on my webcast as well, um, they were asked to fabricate Bigfoot stories, Bigfoot really? reports in that da database. Yeah, no, nothing like that ever happened with me. I put on a lot of stuff. Uh, I put most of the Washington State stuff on, mm -hmm. the, on the database. And uh, that's because it, a lot of it came from my records. Right. Um, but I would, I would say that uh, when I talked with Matt directly, uh, there was a couple of times when he would say, you know, Rick, that, that has to be a Bigfoot because it couldn't be anything else. You know, and I go, no, I don't think it. Uh, Confirmation just do that, you know? Plus, he had deadlines. Now he was making a Sasquatch meets Legends meets Science, and the Skookum body cast. Some say it's an elk wall. Mm -hmm. You don't think it's an elk wall? No, I was the one that cast it. Yeah. Okay. No. But was there a deadline because there was a production company there? Elk and coincidentally, oh, we found mud that we think a Bigfoot might have. No, no deadline. There was no deadline. No deadline. Okay. No deadline. They wanted to show what uh, what happens out in the field, and they got all the stuff. They got the interviews. They got some wackos out there traipsing around. Mm -hmm. They got some uh, sound blasting that was pretty impressive. Uh, I found a couple of tracks for them to um, go ahead and videotape. I found a trackway that they uh, videotape, and um, it was uh, it was just happenstance that. One of the things that everybody poo-pooed said, no, this doesn't, this won't work. Right. When Tom Powell came up with the idea, we've got to stick out this fruit all over the place. And Matt had already gotten a thermal camera, one of the first thermal cameras ever used on a Bigfoot expedition. We went out and started cutting open all this fruit with the thermal and showing how we could see heat impressions going across the road and stuff. And all of a sudden we found heat impressions going across the road. That's when we said, wait, maybe this is going to work. We get, my truck broke down. We finally made it back into camps. Uh, Leroy and Derek went out and finished it. Then we came back the next morning. We went to go get a, a, a battery for my truck. And that's when we went to the first fruit site. And lo and behold, there was something strange there. At first, I thought it was a car. At first, I thought it was a car. It, it, it was a weird looking, you know, like the differential of a car had run into the mud or something like that. Mm -hmm. Although there was no tire tracks. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, what is this thing? We're walking around. Derek's going, I don't see any tire tracks. I don't see any. Yeah, we're at, we're at Sasquatch Summit and um, the only quiet place was in this hallway. And I know you're probably watching this thinking, this is not quiet. But it's the quietest place, actually. <laughs> Otherwise, it'll be 30 degree weather outside, and it's much warmer in here. So okay, continue. So uh, yeah, there was uh, the mud was was moved in a in a certain way that you know it just looked weird. Mm -hmm. And so we were searching around. Derek was looking at the animals. Uh, Leroy Fish was looking for birds. Mm -hmm. He's in the birds. Okay, so birds have a tendency to do some strange things as do squirrels. Mm -hmm. People put up rocks on stumps. We saw that here at the conference. Squirrels knock them down. Big ones. Mm -hmm. I see it in my yard. Uh, birds. Birds pick up fruit. So when we saw the fruit moved around and half of it eaten, we were thinking, okay, birds got to it. Right. We get down. No, it, it wasn't. All the pieces were in this impression. The fruit was way over there. And there was like finger marks that drug the fruit back. And then we saw a tooth impression inside of one of the pieces of fruit. And Meldrum made up a, a cast of that, that tooth impression. And we haven't shown it to anybody. But then the, we uh, were talking and, and I'm going, well, you know what? We got all this plaster. Leroy wanted some plaster. So I brought him uh, 150 pounds of plaster because that's I get it at my work. And I had uh, three two and a half pound or two and a half gallon buckets full of plaster. I think we have enough. We can make a cast of this. So we scrounged up off of our toilet 
uh, the 2x4s the and, and made a frame going around. Then we put in the splash uh, coating and then put up the backup. And then I ripped the tent poles out of my tent and embedded those in there. And then we waited and waited and waited. And finally, we pulled it and put it in Derek's truck on an airbed. We didn't touch it, we let uh, Meldrum and. Uh, was, there, was there any DNA that was extracted from it at all? No, no, we tried to do DNA and we were led down the wrong path. We put it in alcohol. Oh gosh. And uh, it was uh, Dr. Bamanek, he's a clinical psychologist, and he said we need to put it in anything that we find in alcohol. So we put the apple bits in the alcohol, uh, hair in alcohol. Uh, I think that was everything that we thought that might have DNA. And when we did the test, it said everything was broken down, there was nothing. Oh man. So we, we learned a little bit valuable lesson, not alcohol. Right, right, right. Pro kill or no kill? The what? The pro kill or no kill when it comes to a Sasquatch? I don't think it really matters to me uh, if you don't kill one, but if you kill one, uh, It seems to be a hot topic in the bigger world. It's, I think what's the bigger topic is how many are there? What's the, what's the population density? Is it uh, like... I bet Tom Powell thinks there's 1,500 in this state, and I think Meldrum thinks there might be only as little as 20. So that's the real question: is can they afford to have one kill? Mm, yeah, that'll affect its population, the gene pool. Yeah. yeah, I think the topic of pro kill no kill uh, has risen in the past few years because of hoaxers claiming they shot and killed Bigfoot. There's Rick Dyer, mm -hmm. Justice Smith. You know, that was a big topic in 78, the first uh, um, Sasquatch conference up in Columbia. Oh, yeah. It was, uh, we had uh, Grover Krantz that pulled out this great big bullet and he just started describing the damage it would do, how much it, how much the bullet weighed, how, uh, what kind of a weapon he was going to uh, use, and mm -hmm. how he drives around at night on logging roads with the weapon in his, in his car and a friend driving, and that he was going to shoot one. Yeah, because I remember Grover Krantz. Uh, changed positions on that debate. At first, he was against killing a Bigfoot. Now he's like, okay, one, but not two. If no, you kill two. one for science, two, you should go to prison. Maybe um, it depends on what it is. I mean, there's a there's no law about killing a Bigfoot, except for if it's a fur-bearing animal, then you are going to get a ticket. Right. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Rick, for joining us on After Hours. Yeah. It was uh, my pleasure. Yeah, it was great talking to you about Bigfoot and. BFR no. <laughs> yeah, and it's good guess. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Grover Krantz. It's not looking too good these days. Have you seen him in the museum? I <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I took that picture. With him oh, with you the did? With the dog oh, thanks, thanks for the horror. That's forever embedded. It's like Jaws. Uh oh. For oh, you. wow! Thank you. Look what I'm getting. Oh, he's filming. Yes, I'm right. That is Cindy Cadell from the BFR No. You like the BFR No? I'm not going to have any comment. <laughs> Either confirm or deny that. Thank you, time. Josiah. You're welcome, man. Hey, check out Ewan. Ewan! Future Squatcher. In flannel. Ah, right on. <laughs> Dr. Jeff Meldrum called what the Bigfoot community perceived to be a hoaxer his colleague, Todd Standing. And um, some researchers that are high up there on the, on the ladder kind of went after you, yeah. Kathy Strain, yeah. uh, and had an opinion on it. And I wanted to get your input on that. Yeah. Make your life exciting. Don't make it in a bookstore. <laughs> Come on, get out of the bookstore, Stephen. I have no life. It's all Bigfoot. 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 Ah. Get out. Go into the city. Go into the city and you can find friends. Real friends. 